Mina, konbanwa, Jesus Freaking Gamer here. Back with a little bit of part two. That was probably very horrible English. On the story in Judges. So in part one, um, the summary of that message essentially was the Israelites failed to take over the promised land the way they should have. They left some Canaanites alive, which they should not have. And it was completely their fault. If they relied on the Lord, there's nothing that they couldn't have done. They were slaves to the most powerful nation in the world. And then God, single-handedly, without their effort, set them free. Organized them into, as they were crossing the wilderness over the course of the 40 years, which was also a punishment for that generation's disobedience. They were organized into camps. They learned how to... They learn how to be in proper battalions and alignments. Read that in the book of Numbers. Um, the Lord taught them how to camp, how to be um, a military unit. He taught them all those things. So there's no reason, like, they really, if the Lord had really wanted to, He could have just given the promise land into their hand, but that wasn't the point. They were supposed to fight for it. Like, they got into the um, promised land, crossed the Jordan, and after the first harvest, there was no more manna. And once they got to the promised land, there was no more cloud by day and pillar of night, pillar of fire by night leading them because they were where they needed to be. It was their turn to put forth some effort. It was their turn to, sh to actively demonstrate their faith and obedience to God. And they did not do that. So I, think I, read, I definitely read the first two verses from chapter 2 in the last message. I'm going to go ahead and start at the beginning of chapter 2. And I'm actually going to, over the course of this 30 minutes, read all of chapter 2. And just do it verse by verse, point by point. Some of the points in there are a little... I think it can throw people off. I know to an extent it even throws me off a little bit. I have studied it. I've looked at it. I feel like I have a much better grasp of it now, having read it. This will be my third time through the Bible, slowly working through it again, and now in Judges. So, and I've prayed on this, and I've thought through this chapter, and I feel like I've got some truth that I can give to you guys, and some encouragement, and possibly some rebuke that I can give to you guys. Then the, so, starting in verse 1, Then the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochim, and said, I led you up from Egypt, and brought you to the land of which I swore to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. <clears throat> and you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall tear down their altars. But you have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? And as I covered last time, it, some, for some tribes, they seem to really have a hard time getting certain peoples out of their land because they were strong and determined. Others seem to not really care or put forth any effort at all. So varying degrees of disobedience. Some really had no excuse. Some kind of sort of had an excuse. Truthfully, none of them had an excuse. The Lord was on their side. They could have won had they followed him, had they obeyed him, and had they themselves been determined to take over the land and destroy their enemy. The Lord would have made a way for them. So, he fulfilled his end of the covenant. They did not fulfill his, uh, his command to them. They didn't fulfill their end by destroying all the people of the land. Therefore, I also said, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall be thorns in your side, and their gods shall be a snare to you. Now, I don't recall you ever reading that anywhere up to this point in the Bible. And it's interesting because sometimes, so I don't know, it's like, therefore I also said, I don't see that anywhere before this. Sometimes it just it seems to be the Old Testament style. It's like certain details are given later on in the story. And in modern types of writing, you would see those details earlier on in the story because it would quite frankly, help you connect the dots a little bit better. But that's simply not the way they wrote in Old Testament times. So apparently he said that at some point. It wasn't recorded. Apparently it was said. It was one of those facts that I personally do wish it had been written earlier on in the Old Testament. But it wasn't. It was written here. And this leads to a very important point in a lot of prophetic scriptures you'll see later on down the line as I keep reading this. And hopefully you guys are also reading it as well. I completely encourage the reading of the scriptures and the reading of the Word of God. You want to bolster your faith? You want to get to know the Lord and His ways? There's no better way than reading this book right here. Or you can do it on your phone as well. You can do it on... I have a... 
it's a, you, I, you can't really see it very well, but it's a Samsung. It's a Samsung uh, Galaxy Avant. It's one of the little cheapy smartphones. Read it on your computer screen. I got You can't see my mouse, but I'm moving it around on my screen. Just read the scriptures however you can. And as far as translations go, this is a bit of a tangent, but this is an important one. I would say just so long, I really don't like things like the Living Bible that are, what do you call those? They're, they're really, they're just worded so differently from a literal translation. And I should remember, they're called paraphrases. Thank, there we go. They're called paraphrases because they kind of take the Bible and they try, the, uh, the translator rewords it pretty much in a way that they think is accurate, that they think will be easy to understand. And it's not a literal translation like the King James, the New King James, and the New American Standard. And then there is something in between the paraphrase and the literal, and those are called dynamic equivalents. Best example of that would be the NIV, the New International Version, where it's kind of like it takes the literal meaning, but it tries to rearrange the words to make it into really good and proper English. But even if, even if you want to read a paraphrase, do it. Reading the Bible is better than not reading the Bible at all. Find a version you like and read it. Draw close to Him. And the more you read it, the more you'll be inclined to obey. And I would also say the more you will be enabled to obey whatever He says in His Word. When you read it, there is, I would say, a power that enables you to obey. Sometimes that power is conviction, telling you you're wrong. And sometimes that power is just a motivation, like, I really need to do this. And that is the Holy Spirit at work. Important tangent right there. Back to the original point, and you see this, um, I think Jonah's another really good example where he said he would destroy the city of Nineveh if they didn't repent. They repented. He did not destroy the city. And Jonah was all depressed and angry because he wanted them destroyed and they weren't destroyed. If God tells a certain people they'll be destroyed and then they repent, God will relent of the harm he was going to do to them. Now, if people that are righteous disobey him and don't obey his word, he will relent of the good that he was going to do them. He, they didn't fulfill their end of the covenant, so God's not going to fulfill his. And that there is no injustice in God in doing that. If he says, you know, this is my part, I'll do this. This is your part, you do this. If the other end of the party doesn't uphold their end of the agreement, he's not obliged to uphold his end of the agreement. And so it's kind of, part of me wants to say that really sucks because we're weak and we're fragile and we're human. And God knows we're weak and we're fragile and we're human. And he doesn't make agreements with us that are impossible to fulfill or obey. They could have driven out the Canaanites. They, with God backing them up, they obviously had the firepower to do so. And they didn't. They could have upheld their end of the, of the bargain. It wasn't impossible for them. It was challenging it would have stretched their faith. It would have stretched their resources. And there would I'm sure there would have been sacrifices. I'm sure their military um, lost some people. I'm sure they, their victories weren't without death. They, I mean, God could do it. But since he was pretty much entrusting the promised land to them, I'm guessing, I'm inferring just the natural course of things. Since God was like slowly letting them kind of like get their feel of things and he wanted to see if they would obey him or not he was slowly kind of like backing off of doing everything for them so I'm guessing when they went to fight probably some people got killed and God was that I it doesn't say this but that was in a sense that was a test will the, the this is my command will they obey me and they didn't and more, and more testing will follow up here in the upcoming verses where actually the Lord deliberately says in this, I will test them. But yeah, he told them to obey. They didn't. So he will no longer drive them out from before them. It's like you haven't done it up to this point and I will no longer help you to do that. Now they will be thorns in your side and their gods will be a snare to you. Just like he said they would be if they left anyone there. So he's like, okay, now... The bad stuff I said is going to start happening. And then in verse 4, So it was when the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the children of Israel, that the people lifted up their voices and wept. Then they called the name of that place Bochim. By the way, that means weeping. And they sacrificed there to the Lord. 
And when Joshua had dismissed the people, the children of Israel went each to his own inheritance to possess the land. Now you back up to Judges um, chapter 1, verse 1. Now after the death of Joshua, again, the way sometimes the Old Testament tells its stories it kind of, it, the details aren't always completely chronological. Sometimes you get a detail that happened earlier, like I just read, therefore I also said I will not drive them out. He didn't say it before. Well, apparently this whole point happened before Joshua died. So all of this happened at some point prior to the beginning of Judges chapter 1. The exact chronology, not sure what it is. I'm not sure what scholars say. I'm also sure it's not very important. Joshua, the leader, he dropped the ball. Moses dropped the ball when he struck the rock and didn't speak to it. And for that reason, the Lord didn't allow him to go into the promised land. He also missed it. I covered this um, at some point in one of my past mini messages that for whatever reason, the entire race of Israel, when they crossed the Jordan, before they possessed the promised land, they all had to get circumcised. And it's like, why? The, the covenant of circumcision that was given to Abraham, the Mosaic Covenant clearly enforced it, and for some reason, the guy who did the Mosaic Covenant, Moses, did not enforce that. Which, to me, is, well, it's bizarre in and of itself, because that's a very foundational part of the covenant, circumcise the males on the eighth day. Why wouldn't Moses, the leader of Israel at the time, do that? It's doubly fascinating to me, because Moses didn't even circumcise his own two children, after God called him to deliver Israel out of the hands of Egypt. You go back to Mo to Moses chapter. <laughs> Good job, May. If you go back to Exodus, it's in chapter 4, where the Lord actually sought to kill Moses because he had not circumcised his children. That's not a story a lot of people know, and I've never heard a pastor once in all my years as a Christian cover it from the pulpit. So, yeah, shame on the pastors. Why? This is, this is an important story. This is an important part of the Moses story. Why hasn't this been covered in some, you know, Sunday school or some sermon of some kind? You cover the ten plagues, you cover the rod and the wonders that it does. Excuse me there. So why? This is, to me, this is a really important part of the story. Why isn't this covered? And just to, at this time, I'm going to tell you where it is just because it's kind of rare. It's going to be Exodus chapter 4, verses 24, 25, and 26. And it actually was Moses' wife, Zipporah, who circumcised the two sons through the foreskins of Moses' feet, and then the Lord stopped trying to kill him. And I'll add to that, if the Lord wants to kill someone, obviously he can do it immediately. The reason it was known he was trying to kill Moses, it was to make a point. You disobeyed me. You're not in covenant with me. Your son's uncircumcised. And his wife saved his rear end. So yay for godly women. Yay for godly wives. Even though I'm a single man, on behalf of the church, I want to thank all of you guys. Y'all are awesome. And we literally could not do it without you. So back into Judges. <clears throat> Joshua also messed up. He didn't lead the people into conquering all the land that they should have conquered. He didn't lead them in complete victory like he could have and like he should have. So Joshua made that mistake, and Joshua did not fulfill that part of his, that, that end of the covenant that as the leader of Israel, he was first and foremost responsible for fulfilling. So Ch Judges chapter 2, verse 7, So the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua, and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord which he had done for Israel. Now Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died when he was 110 years old. Okay, so we've caught up to Judges chapter 1, verse 1, where Joshua died. And they buried him within the border of his inheritance at timnath Herez in the mountains of Ephraim, on the north side of Mount Gash. When all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord nor the work which he had done for Israel. And before I, well, let me, I'll, I'll read a little bit further. Then the children of Israel did evil in sight of the Lord and served the Baals, and they forsook the Lord God of their fathers who had brought them out of the land of Egypt 
and they followed other gods from among the gods of the people who were all around them, and they bowed down to them, and they provoked the Lord to anger. Once again, there is no excuse for this. I kind of like the way I'm covering the Bible, like a little bit in each chapter as I go along each day. It's kind of, I can kind of reference back to what I've already said, which is really cool. And, and for those of you who follow along and watch these little snippets of sermons that I do, and I, again, I don't want to do 30 minutes every day. One, that would be hard for me to prepare every day. And two, I think it would be hard for everyone to follow a full sermon every day of the week. Most people just, quite frankly, don't have the time. And even if they had the time, they probably wouldn't make the time. Let's just be honest. We haven't gotten much further than Israel, y'all. As the church, we really haven't stepped up our game that much and done, done that well. But there was no excuse. A generation that rose up and didn't know the Lord or the works that he had done, the, the two and a half tribes on the other side of Israel set up a giant memorial so they could say, hey, you're, the guys on the, you other nine and a half tribes on the other side, you guys can't forget that we are partakers of the Lord as well. This monument is set up here, and it reminds us, hey, we're, we're partakers of the covenant of the Lord too. We're also God's people. And that was right there where all 12 tribes could see it. The two and a half who built it on one side of the Jordan, the nine and a half tribes on the other side of the Jordan. It was, it was big enough to where it caught the nine and a half tribes' attention, and they almost took the two and a half tribes to war and obliterated them because they thought it was an altar to an idol. And now all of a sudden, you know, so, and now all of a sudden, all of Israel is running astray of the Lord. They had a memorial right there. And also, when they crossed the Jordan, while the Jordan was still suspended, while the Jordan was still being held up by the power of God far down the way, while the ground was dry where the river had been, each of the elders of the tribe of Israel back in the beginning of Joshua, they each set up a stone for all 12 tribes of Israel in the midst of the Jordan as a memorial and as a reminder of what the Lord had done for Israel. They may not have seen the works of the Lord firsthand like now, I have been privy to see a, a few small miracles in my time. And at some point, just keep watching the channel, I will get into that. It's really cool and unfortunately really rare to see actual miracles with your own eyes. It's so awesome when you do. And I pray to the Lord, I want to see more. I want to see more healing. I want to see more miracles. I want to see more of His power in my life and in the lives of people around me. Who wouldn't want to see that? Who wouldn't want to experience that? And I personally one day want to partake of that and perform stuff like that. Again, I'm the crazy spiritual charismatic Christian right here. So feel free to dislike and troll and make fun of me as much as you like. Feel free. Have a field day. But they, even though they may not have personally seen the Jordan split, they saw the stones in the middle. And they had the Torah and they had the tabernacle where the, where the Ark of the Covenant was. There were several memorials. God set all these memorials in place so that the people would remember. And he said so many times in the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the first five books of the Bible that Moses wrote, do these things as a memorial so that when the generation comes up and says, what does this mean? You can say, the Lord brought us up out of Egypt. And here's a reminder that we're his people, and that he's our God. They had no excuse. None. They grew up not knowing the Lord. There were plenty of reminders all around them of what the Lord had done. The Torah, the tabernacle, the, the Ark of the Covenant, the giant altar that the two and a half tribes built, the memorial stones that were in the Jordan River that were placed there and were in the midst of the Jordan once the river started flowing again. But they what so yeah they walked away but there was no excuse there was no excuse for the Israelites not to drive them out the Lord was justified in not fulfilling his end of the covenant since they did not fulfill theirs it's like you're not going to do your part fine I'm not going to do mine the Lord is not criminal for doing that that was the covenant he made with them and then the people the next generation had no excuse because they had reminders all around them, public reminders of what the Lord had done, as well as a complete written record. So going back down to verse uh, 13, they forsook the Lord and served Baal and the Ashtoreths. 
And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. So he delivered them into the hands of plunderers who despoiled them. And he sold them into the hands of their enemies all around, so that they could no longer stand before their enemies. Wherever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for calamity, as the Lord had said, and as the Lord had sworn to them. And they were greatly distressed. The Lord said, he emphasized the curses a lot. And one of my, one of my messages back in my channel is how curses seem to be emphasized much more than the blessing. That's because the Lord was warning them. He told them point blank. Your, Joshua and Moses both said they had their mistakes. But the Lord forgives mistakes. He forgave Moses. I have no doubt he forgave Joshua. And those two men, despite their mistakes, despite their blunders as leaders, and despite not fulfilling everything they should have as leaders of the people of the Lord, and I'm sure as the Lord raises me up in ministry, I know I'm going to make mistakes as well. Count on it. I will fail you. Here on YouTube, anyone knows me in real life, I will fail you. Of this, I am sure. I can promise you. Please have mercy and forgive me when that failure time comes because it's coming. Moses and Joshua both told the people of Israel, you will forsake the Lord. You won't serve him faithfully. Curses will come upon you. They were warned in advance. The Lord wasn't unjust for punishing the people. He wasn't even wrong for killing his own people. He told them in advance, you're going to fall away. I will punish you and curse you and destroy you at the time, and you will have no excuse. There were reminders everywhere. There was a written account. The leaders had no excuse. The followers, the regular Israelites, had no excuse. <laughs> And that was one of the things I kind of wanted to do and what I want to do with the rest of this chapter as well. It's not that the Lord needs me to justify him, but I would like to explain the ways of the Lord to you guys. If I, and I don't believe I'm being pretentious in doing this. I believe I've read the Bible correctly. I believe I understand the message here. I will also dare to say, I believe I know the heart of my God. He loves humans. Jesus Christ who died for us is living proof of how much he loves humans. He loved them back then. He called Israel out as his chosen people. He remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, and when, Moses, when they repeatedly sinned against him in the wilderness and God said he was going to destroy him, Moses said, please don't destroy him. Please, for your great name's sake, don't destroy them. He didn't destroy them. The Lord is abundant and rich in mercy and love and grace. And his, while his curses extend to four generations, his mercy extends to thousands who love him and keep his commandments. And the Lord gives people so many opportunities to obey, so many opportunities to believe. It's not the Lord's fault when we disobey, when we fall away, after he gives us chance time and again to follow him. This wasn't just one mistake and whack-a-mole, you're done. It wasn't just... It wasn't even something small and petty like, well, you didn't offer the burnt sacrifice, right? You didn't cut off that fatty loaf like I told you to. Bam! You're dead. No. They forsook him. They served idols. They, for, they went and served other gods who are not gods at all. And so he opposed them. He killed them. He destroyed them. He didn't allow them to keep the land that he gave them. And he was completely just in doing so. He warned them time and again. He told them straightforward, you're going to disobey me. And even being told the straightforward truth, they went and disobeyed him with all the written records and with all the memorials that were surrounding them. And it's not like their fathers who obeyed the Lord didn't raise them up and say, hey, by the way, these are the things the Lord did for us. It's not like that happened. They made their mistakes. All generations made their mistakes, and all generations are left without excuse. In one way or the other, the Lord makes provision to let each generation know the truth, and they still messed it up. They still messed it up. And then in verse 16, back to the mercy of the Lord, nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges who delivered them out of the hand of those who plundered them. Yet they would not listen to their judges, but they played the harlot with other gods and bowed down to them. They turned quickly from the way in which their fathers walked in obeying the commandments of the Lord. They did not do so. So, it's mentioned that the fathers obeyed the commandments of the Lord despite their mistakes. Despite Joshua not leading the people, 
to destroy all the people among them, despite the people, some some lazier than others, some having fiercer opponents than others, they still didn't destroy the enemies among them. They were still credited as people who served the Lord. And the generation after them was not esteemed so. They quickly turned away from obeying the Lord God. And they play, I want it, before I give the salvation message, I want to emphasize that they played the harlot. That's a strong terminology. That is a marriage and a sexual terminology. The Lord, His love for His people is an intimate, groom-type love. He loves His people as, he, as a man would love his wife. And he, tre and he thinks of His people kind of like he talks about Christ and the bride. God wants to be intimate with each and every one of us. He loves us. He loves us like a, it's a spousal type of love. He wants to be very close to us. He wants to be intimate with us. And so when, when, when we sin against him, when we transgress the covenant, it's like transgressing a marriage covenant. It's like adultery. It's betrayal. And he's not the one at fault. He's given us every chance to obey. And so many chances to repent and turn to him. And we're the ones who don't. And I still didn't finish everything I wanted to say. And that's okay. That, you know, God willing, I'll live to this Sunday. And I can preach more sermons. And I'll, you know, God willing, this channel will last for several years to come. I'd like it to. I'd like a chance to do that. Um, I don't know what opportunities will come my way and what what the Lord will call me into, but I'd like to keep this channel going, just my two little videos a day. Um, I'd like to keep doing that. But right now, right now to you, not to just everyone watching this video, to you, I'm doing this personally, to you who's watching this video, the Lord ex is extending right now His hand of mercy and grace and love to you. And right now He's calling you to repent. His Son, Jesus Christ, died on a cross for you 2,000 years ago, shedding His blood for all the wrongdoings you've done, for all the times you've turned on God, for all the times you haven't obeyed Him, for all the times you've walked in the wickedness. And let's just call it what it is. It wasn't just a little white lie. It wasn't just a little perverted thought. It was sin. It was evil. It was wickedness. And he died and shed his blood on the cross so you could be forgiven for that. And, not, and he didn't just die on the cross. He, li he lives. He's alive today. He rose again three days later, later. And he's alive forevermore. And right now, he, the great and glorious God, Jesus Christ, is offering you forgiveness that he himself purchased for you on the cross. Won't you accept it today? He's reaching out his hand to you. Won't you grab his hand back? Just tell him that you're, you know you're a sinner, you've made mistakes, that you've done bad things. Tell him you need his help and you need his forgiveness. Tell him that he's the God you want to worship. Some of you guys watching this video, you're feeling that right now. You know what I'm talking about right now, and it's getting to you in the heart. Listen to that voice. That's not just a feeling. It feels like a feeling, and it's something you feel very strongly. It's not just a feeling. That's God himself tugging on your heartstrings and saying, Son, daughter, I want you. I want you to be mine. So just tell him that you want him back and that you're sorry for the things you've done wrong and that you believe he did die on the cross for you and that he rose again from the dead. And if you want like a prayer model to follow, pray this prayer with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner. I've done things that are wrong. And I know you love me. You love me so much that you died on the cross for me. You paid the price for sin that I should have rightly paid. And I also believe that you rose again three days later. You're alive and well, and you're able to forgive me for my sins right now. So please do that, Lord Jesus. Please forgive me for my sins. I believe you died on the cross. I believe you rose again. I believe you're God, and I want you to be my God. Thank you, Lord, for hearing this prayer. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer, then you are now a Christian. You're a son or a daughter of the Most High God. And that's awesome! 
Welcome to the family. That is so amazing and incredible. I'm so if my and if my video was like the thing that kind of pulled you in, I'm doubly thankful that I could be a part of that awesome process of you becoming a Christian and you finding new life in Christ. Try to find some other people that believe the same thing as you that also believe in Jesus. Um, try to find a church that believes that the Bible is the word of God and that believes that Jesus Christ is God and that he died on the cross and rose again. They believe the same thing as you. And try to read this Bible daily. Like I was saying earlier in the message, try to read this every single day. It will change your life and it will empower you to obey the words that are written in it. That, that might sound a little weird. It might sound a little spooky to you. All I can say is as someone who's lived this out for quite a while, I kind of want to say almost longer than I care to remember. It makes me feel kind of old. <laughs> But hey, truth is truth, I'm 35, I am old. And I've seen it happen in my life and in others' life. When you read this word, it changes you. When you read the Bible, the word of God, it changes you. So find one that you can read, one that you're comfortable with. Even if it's a paraphrase that I don't personally like, like the Living Bible or the New Living Translation, just go for it and dig in. And just and make sure to talk to God a little bit every day. Just even a simple... <laughs> How are you doing today, God? I love you. Thank you for the cross. That's a prayer. Mix in with a little bit of praise and thanksgiving because you're praising him for what he did and you're thanking him for what he did on the cross. That's prayer. That's all there is to prayer. It's not fancy. It's not a bunch of big words and some weird posture on your knees with your eyes closed. Humana, humana, humana. It's as simple as talking to him. So do, if you are a believer now, I encourage you, find that group of people who believe like you. Read the Word of God every day and talk to God a bit every single day. You'll be surprised at how much it'll change your life. And then it can even impact the lives of those around you. Thank you guys very much for watching this. I love you guys and God bless.